Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Designers at Home. We have today with us um, William Turner from the William Turner Gallery at Bergamot Station in Santa Monica. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Mark. Great to have you here. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Great. So Bill's going to uh, treat us to a little tour of the gallery a little bit later. And But, you know, first of all, Bill, you're you're... You've been in Los Angeles for some time, but you're originally from Connecticut. Is that right? Correct. I grew up in Westport, Connecticut. <clears throat> and then you, um, you've you lived in, I think, Colorado and California. You studied um, in Colorado and San Francisco, but you studied law. So, yeah. So, first of all, yes, any state that starts with C, I like there. So, I grew up in Connecticut, and I went to college in Colorado, and then to yeah, you know, after college, um, pretty early on, I was the artist in the family. I was always painting um, growing up, and when I got to high school, <coughs> teacher that opened up the, the greater depth possible <coughs> with uh, with art. It wasn't just drawing something to look like, something, which I was always getting great. That looks so much like your uncle Bob or whatever. So um, I started. I started to realize how much more possibility there was. I skipped as many classes as possible in high school, <laughs> and, which was challenging. <clears throat> and then college had just started this this um, unique curriculum where you took one course at a time. So you did a semester's worth of work in a month. And I thought, wow, I that and I don't have to skip any classes. It's only one class. Uh, and my teacher said, while you're doing that, you're clearly very taken with don't forget to develop your mind so you hey, so take philosophy. Take, along with art classes, that's what I did in college. And, um, and I dove deep into it and, um, and loved it. I took a year off in the, uh, like after my sophomore year, and I came back to San Francisco looking to meet an artist to study with. Uh, didn't find anyone, did find, loved California, San Francisco. So um, I, I ended up studying that year off with my high school art teacher's art teacher, a guy named Michael Scope, who looked and sculpted like Rodin. He was, like, if you saw a picture of him, he looked so much like Rodin. And in fact, he was a protege of a Croatian sculptor, Mike, uh, Michael uh, Mestrovich, Ivan Mestrovich. And Mestrovich uh, was a student of Rodin's. So um, studied with Rodin. So there was a Rodin aspect to scope to me, kind of stories and, you know, how, how just to learn uh, sculpture and drawing. So I did that for that year. And after that, I studied with this um, artist the idea that that's going to be a career. And so after college, I moved to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I just found that I had more um, than in the studio all day, even though I was that seriously. Uh, and I started question this is how I should best make my living. I was very gregarious and social, like being around people. So that isolated 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day studio wasn't calling to me the way I thought. So um, while I still love making art, I started questioning I might otherwise make a living. And I went to law school, got accepted. And really, completely accidentally, I took a job in a gallery in San Francisco to earn money to go to law. And, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I can and was that, was there a particular piece of art or something that um, you reacted to so strongly? Um, a particular piece of art in when I was working with this gallery or? Yeah, would, yes. Well, the gallery was... Um, uh, in San Francisco, sort of on Fisherman's Wharf, which was, you know, height of tourist traffic kind of area. Yeah. But um, it did have Picasso, Hero, Chagall, uh, uh, artwork, both uh, very good graphics by those artists and drawing and so on. So I, 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 those were all artists I knew about and loved and got to talk about. And I was that growing up, I'd take people to galleries and museums to show them pieces that really spoke to me and kind of shared mm -hmm. excitement, which what I get to do now, 
my own gallery. And so it kind of led naturally this path. I still didn't want to get a law degree, though. So postponing law school for a couple of years, work with this gallery. I continued working with the gallery law school at night. And uh, so I'm also a lawyer now, um, and uh, which I love, but it's just a little bit more. So I'm on the board of California Lawyers for the Arts. We help yes. artists doing that for, for years, but about as long as I've been in the gallery. And how is it that you decided to locate in Los Angeles, locate your gallery here? Uh, well, that's it. So I loved living in San Francisco. I had just talked to my landlord about buying my Sausalito, which at the time seemed like a fairly hefty price. It was a three-bedroom house that overlooked the arena. <laughs> well, he really tells me it's now worth about three Fifty to three hundred five thousand dollars, and I go, wow, deep. But yeah, I know. But I am willing to sell. I, I said I, I made love right then, before I knew whether I passed the bar or not. The people I was running the gallery for in San Francisco, said, if you want to open a gallery in L.A., do you want to move down there? I'm tired of working for these guys, and I, but I didn't know bar yet, and I didn't have the money to open my gallery. Okay, I'll do it for a year. Obviously, no right mind wants to live longer than a year. I, I treated it like I said, it'll be like I'm going on safari. Every <laughs> LA is, is uh, not where you want to live. But, so I came down here with zero expectation and quickly um, realized that this was 1986. LA, Mocha had the hair. Right. And all of a sudden, I felt like is really coming into its own and everyone seemed very open in a way that they weren't in san francisco san francisco field felt much more stratified and old money and difficult to break in kind of whereas mm -hmm. you want to meet frank gary this place you know you want to meet ed richet and and joe good and and Lynn bell and you know they're out in tennis and you know you, they have lunch everyone Extremely open to, to that was a very very exciting period uh, for art in Los Angeles. It was it was I completely yeah. through no uh, genius or um, on my part. I ended up opening a gallery in Venice, right in the heart of all the guys, and so I got to know them uh, all just because I, that's where I ended up accidentally opening the gallery. I had some to, the space in Venice. It was a tiny little space no parking, no storage. And I went down to see them. This is awful. I mean, I'm going to find you. And there's, and even if they do, there's no park and you don't have any storage. It's like a square foot space. So about a year later, Hey, we found a good guy. And I go, thank God. Good for you. But I was also looking and they said, well, I don't release. Do you want it? And I went, Absolutely. I'm in. Right. So at that time, and um, and uh, you know, I mean, like that was the right move. I was hanging for, uh, for an artist named Greg Miller. Went across the street. I heard Dennis Hopper was having a little open to market restaurant. But you know, there'll be a lot of people there. I could um, new gallery and kind of. Network. I saw Dennis and he was talking to some guy, and I went, "It kind of looks like Robert Rauschenberg." And it was. And so I started talking with them. They were very friendly. And I told them this new gallery. And about, so that back to continue hanging my show. About 15 minutes later, I saw Rauschenberg walking by and I invited him in to meet the artist and, you know, show him my mm -hmm. new gallery. And he hung out with us for like an hour and a half. And I thought, you know, this, and that was just the beginning of, you know, how cool it was there. I, in a year, I moved from that space to, Dwayne Valentine studio space, also on Market Street, about a block off the beach. So Dwayne was my landlord, and I had an amazing experience there. And then when L.A. Louver moved to the space next door to where they are now, I moved into that, and uh, which had Bell's old studio. Uh, and Robert Graham was my neighbor, and I was living in the back of my gallery just to make sure that I could pay my rent. <laughs> Uh, Beverly Glenn, but everyone was on the street. Tony Bill was my, he lived right behind. Uh, yes. Then um, Robert Graham and Angelica Houston, his, uh, there was David, 
called a musician. He lived there in his recording studio. Andy Summers was It was like a really cool um, period. Yeah, art just exploded in Los Angeles at that time. And it all seemed to be happening in the Venice area. Yeah, yeah. And it was when I got to know everyone, I became uh, editor of Art Magazine um, right around that time interview all of these people and really got to know them. So, uh, yeah, it was a great to too. So Start. let me ask you a question. How has your, um, you know, how has your taste um, in art uh, developed and evolved over your career from the time you were a young person to now? That's a great question. Um, when I was studying, uh, and still when I, when I, met, I tend to be more figurative in, you know, I, I do of people and places sort of, or culture of, of people. Mostly what I started showing um, in large were, were non-objective um, you could say abstract artists. And, uh, and maybe it's because that was that, that was beyond my immediate sense of expertise whatever. Uh, it fascinated me. So, so Overall, I've shown a lot in artwork that I have narrative or artwork, um, not exclusively by any means. A show I have up right now is a show by Mark Steve Greenfield. But mm-hmm. uh, and when I was in the studio space, I was sort of force fed uh, to learn about the light and uh, because I was in one of the preeminent space studio at Robert Irwin been on that street also his studio had been right across the street where which later became 72 restaurant and when Earl had his show at uh, Mocha his big retrospective in 1994 Guy Dill and, and Butterfield came up to me they said hey you know Irwin did a piece on Market Street 1980 called One Moved where he took the front wall off of Melinda Wyatt's gallery across it and the idea was See how the light changed your sense of the volume of the space as as uh, light changed times of day, and uh, you could only in the street. There was nothing, there was no way to go into the gallery. Something was looked at and through the volume that he created, uh, and you could see during the daytime. My gallery across the street, right where that was, and it had a big picture, and and, and they said, you know, lied every minute higher day of how the light changed show that on the interior space and you could do it and, and be sort of like a the really interesting to that original piece. so we did that i did it all of it was a little quicker than staying, um watching actual time of light changing and so you but you really got that original piece. you could only see it from the street um at night in my gallery, uh, promoted that as an actual event as retrospect. So I learned about a lot of artists through doing stuff like that. Great. So let's talk about um, your current show at the gallery. Great. So your current exhibition is called Halo. It is. All right. Uh, and and tell us a little bit about it. So the artist is Mark Stephen Greenfield and subject of the show are um, all of these black historical figures, generally ranging over a period of 500 years, roughly uh, correlating to the period of, of uh, the slave. Um, and either resisted or ingenious uh, found a way to live under uh, enslavement. And, uh, and they're fascinating stories. Uh, a lot of them are um, stories that I had never heard before, and you hear these, and you go, "How? How did I never hear about that uh, in my history class?" Uh, and I'll give you a great example, uh, and I'll show this. We can do a tour physically in a second. Okay. I'll just show you this. This is a cover of a catalog we just did for the show, which we picked up yesterday. And this cover image is a detail of uh, a work called Calipia, and this woman. Um, is a fictional character written by a Spanish writer in the early 1800s who was um, an African 
Amazonian queen who, in the, in the story, ruled over an island called California that was inhabited by an army of black Amazonian warriors. And the island was supposedly uh, 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 filled with riches and pearls and gold and so on. Mm-hmm. And so it was a place. So when the Spaniards, who were familiar with that story, got to the West Coast, they saw the, the, what they thought was the California, and it kind of having this fantasy this explorers and going, you know, just over the next prize, there's going to be an island filled with beautiful women and all the riches you could imagine. Let's go one more mile. And, and that kind of was a force for them. When they saw this island, they, they named it California. It turned out to be the Baja Peninsula. Um, okay. not named for the entire state of California. Now, I was on the California Arts Council for eight years, which is a government agency for the which is designed to promote the art and culture throughout the state. I never knew that California came from this fictional black female warrior. Uh, and so it's that that, you know, through exhibition, people are kind of waking up to realizing these stories are amazing. And just, you've got two very interesting pieces behind you right now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what these pieces are? Sure. Let me, let me, um, the camera a little bit, um, so we can walk around. Let's see. This, so we are talking about the light and space art, and you could say one of the things that has really captured my attention is how that idea of light and space has um, been distilled into the next generation of artists. Uh, we're looking at, at a work by Casper Brindle called Light Glyph. Uh, and it is really designed to be a piece that you kind of move around. And you see how the light kind of shifts and changes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that, um, you know, I'm going to encourage everybody who's watching to get to your gallery and see this because I particularly like these pieces. And there was something um, looking at, at his works that remind me a little bit of James Turrell. And so uh, my son just got back. I sent my son to Ireland to see a, uh-huh. a, a, a sky garden piece that Turrell did, which are very much like the sky rooms he has several up here in Los Angeles. Um, Turrell is, is, to me, Turrell and Irwin both really – kind of develop the philosophical underpinnings that that kind of um, are the basis for what we call light and space. And it's really very mm-hmm. simple. It's where the artists start to move from the idea of art being an object and, and something that is distinct and, you know, it's, is to be regarded. And instead, the artwork becomes a catalyst for your experience. Mm-hmm. And, and you can say that's true with the piece we're looking at now with Casper because you really ha- are encouraged by the way that the light changes as you walk around it. You're encouraged to see how you react to that and how it changes the feeling of your sense of yourself in that space. And that's very much, uh, there was a great quote that I just read from Terrell the other day, which was the essence that my art, my artwork is not um, something to be looked at or to be um, uh, evaluated it's it's something to be experienced as uh, you know by each individual um and and it takes it from that objective perspective so casper was a studio assistant for eric Orr, who was also sort of in that oh, uh, yeah. group of, of light and space artists and but he's taken it really to another dimension i mean what he um i look at his work as as uh, poems to his love of nature. He's out on the water all the time. How light reflects off water, your feeling of peace and serenity when you're in nature. Those are the same sorts of, of feelings he's trying to evoke when you're looking at the um, okay. uh, There's another piece here. This is by Jimmy Gleason. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is done with silver nitrate, which is great on top of whatever you see texture wise or, or shape wise is done as, as an underpainting 
um, it creates a texture. And then he sprays the silver nitrate on top of it. And, and it's silver when it is first done. And then he can, then he can um, uh, spray on a, a color, different colors afterwards. He's also, just like Casper, uh, Jimmy Gleason is um, wanting us to, to kind of move around the work to see how, you see how you get a little bit of a purple reflection in that. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I get closer, you'll see uh, all of a sudden the darkness a little bit reflected. He's very much about incorporating whatever is in the room into the piece. So the piece is constantly changing, not only as you move around it, but depending on who and what is reflected in it, you get different color reads and, and so on. And so very interactive, very um, dynamic. Um, likewise, this is piece by Andy Moses, Ed Moses' son. Um, who just had an, a fantastic show in London at J.D. Malak Gallery. And Andy's work also, he's using a pearlescent paint that as you get closer, we'll start to, you'll see these kind of shifts in color and uh, very much like an oyster shell when, when it change, the color changes in light. This one is, has a sense of a lot of texture, but if you touch this painting, which I encourage you to do if you want to own it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this uh, is completely smooth. So the texture is just how the light is hitting. Uh, hitting the painting. It's a stunning part. piece. Yeah. yeah. So, and Andy also very much uh, about um, interactive uh, qualities. He's also someone who loves nature. He's out on the water. And he said one of his inspirations about being a, becoming an artist was, um, seeing how the light played off the water when he was out um, surfing. Um, and so very much that sense of movement across the surface of light is, is something that you see in all, virtually all of his work. Uh, all of these three artists we just talked about are very experimental. Whenever I go to the studio, I never know um, what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna see. Uh, you know, they're always changing, it's always dynamic. Um, I'm going to just switch back this. And then there's one more artist in this back room, Curtis Ripley, okay. who's also an um, abstract painter, very much um, incorporates his love of music and poetry in his work. And so um, you see in his surfaces, there's a real sense of um, depth and mood and tone and um, uh, they're very evocative of these kind of emotions dates that you find when you're listening to great jazz or reading a wonderfully moving poem. So he's using paint in the same way to evoke that same uh, state of contemplation and uh, reverence. I don't know if reverence is the right word, but we'll, we'll stick with it. Um, if you want, now we could go into the main gallery. By it's the way, it's nice to get a reason, glimpse of the gallery. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you a quick, uh, just an overview. Uh, there's where I just was sitting and with the lights. Uh, so all of these are the halo pieces, and I'll zoom in on Califia that I was just talking about. Yeah, it's an incredible piece. So you see this detail. Now, this style, this is sort of done, all of these are in a Byzantine style, which means um, sort of there's a flatness of perspective. Uh, and these grew out of a show that I did with Mark two years ago called Black Madonna. And, um, oh, right. Yes. <clears throat> and That was and a wonderful did, show. Well, it was amazing because we had had to postpone it because of COVID and whatnot it was postponed about a year and a half uh, from when we initially wanted to show it. But after that time, it turned out that we did the show right after a summer of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. And the show really spoke to that. It kind of did a role reversal. So you were looking at a very black Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. And in the background were these white supremacists who were getting their asses kicked in various different ways. And it really spoke to the moment. Uh, and I, it was a sensational show. Okay, this is an amazing character. 
This is a Henry Box Brown, who was a slave living in Virginia. And he devised a plan of escape by um, having himself packed into a box and shipped to Philadelphia to some abolitionists who were sympathetic. So he, the box that he was, was packed into was three feet by two and a half feet by two feet. It was nailed shut. There was a little hole for air. And it was shipped by wagon, by train, by steamboat, by train again, by wagon again. And 27 hours later arrived in Philadelphia. And when they opened the box, he popped out. He said, well, hello, gentlemen. And, uh, and they were kind of amazed that this method of escape had worked, but they were really amazed. They kind of, yeah, yeah, this is great. But you know what's incredible is the Postal Service, this express delivery is, is unbelievable. It only took 27 hours. It's to hard to believe it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So he became quite a noted speaker and, and a real character. He had a career as a magician and he would do performances, but... Shortly after he arrived in Philadelphia, which was 1849, in 1850, the United States government passed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which said that slave states could go into free states and recapture escaped slaves. So Henry Box Brown, um, not wanting to get recaptured, moved to London for the rest of his life uh, and performed there in various ways um, uh, about uh, the abolition of slavery. And, you know, was a complete character, and he wrote a book called "The Narrative of the Life of Henry Box Brown," written by himself. And very proud of the fact that he was literate and was able to write the book himself. Oh. you know, Bill, listening to you um, talk about these pieces, the history that's involved in them, um, the technique. You know, um, I'm frequently asked by people, and I'm sure you are too. You know, how do I go about? Um, learning about art, studying art, learning a little bit more. I want to start collecting what to do. And, you know, if you just casually go into a museum or an art gallery and just kind of pass through and look at things without really knowing about the artist and about what inspired the piece, you're missing a lot. Um, you're missing a lot of what has to do with the art. You are. And, and I think one of the things that I love is is really taking time with people to to meet that interest and that inquisitiveness uh and you know and and you know i love people who ask very naive questions i don't you know mm -hmm. get this what is that about why is this interesting that opens the door for me to kind of really take by the hand you know oftentimes uh, i'll get looking at a, a abstract painting they don't know how to look at it. If they have, right. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and they'll say, what am I supposed to look at? I mean, I see it, but I focus on what does it mean? I'll say, okay, let's back up a little bit. And in that, this is a work of music, no words. So what do you do when you listen? Like, you know, it, it, like classical music. You let your imagination go you let it by the music too bring you along on an emotional journey, uh, you start to notice the things you're having and you kind of look inward and inspire me. Um, so I, I said, abstract paintings are a lot like visual jazz. You know, they're a lot like a uh, uh, non-piece of artwork, uh, dance, uh, where there's no words, the story, but you, move it, you see the elegant race. So you could look at an abstract painting the same way. You could say, well, you know, the, the, those lines are graceful. The way those shapes are so precise, like think of uh, Elsworth Kelly, very minimal, but right. mm -hmm. um, energy in some of those shapes. And I'll, so just to kind of show that I'm not a snob, I, I didn't really get Ellsworth Kelly for a long time. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> you know, no. Red. I'm sorry about the swearing. It, it's a red triangle on, uh, you know, on a canvas. Why is that interesting? And I went to his show at, um, I think 
at Mocha many years That's ago. That's the show that changed my my whole vision of his work was the inaugural show that he had at Mocha and walking into that room filled with his work. I thought it was so exciting. Uh, I did too. Uh, all of a sudden, I got and and I said, somewhat said, so what is it? And it was something Kelly said where a lot of the shapes were informed landscape and mass. And, and I turned into the feeling like think of think of a bow, like a bow and arrow type of. If you draw the the string back, I'm trying to get it. You draw the back triangle that is created that straight back has so much energy that is that is uh, ready beast and there, there's something in shape attention that, that is really powerful those are how the shapes of elsewhere are to me mm -hmm. they have inherent unleashed power these it's sort of pent up and you know, very much a coiled experience so that's just one observation I made looking at that show whereas before I didn't get it, now I do and uh, right. so, mm -hmm. so I love taking people I still I mean one of the great thrills for me to have someone walk in the gallery and, and be sort of an open sponge and say tell me why this is, is so uh, exciting to you get it and yeah. you know and, you know, a lot of people are so intimidated, as you say, by art. And it's really, it's, you know, everything's about education. So you don't have to like it. You can learn about it. You don't have to like it. But it's really fascinating to study why people paint and um, the whole reason behind the artwork. So, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about what a vibrant um, art scene um, Los Angeles and Venice was. Um, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and so forth. So today, you know, we have a wealth of artists here in Los Angeles, galleries such as yours, and really some great museums. You know, we now have the two Getty Museums. We have the Arm & Hammer, MoCA. And um, we now have um, Los Angeles County Art Museum on a new sort of new direction. So yeah. let me hear your thoughts about what is happening and developing with um, LACMA. Well, you know, I, I, when I first met Michael Coven, um, I interviewed him when I was still writing for Venice Magazine, and he had mm -hmm. a dance, which was a beautiful show, really, really uh, exciting. Another one I didn't really get, and I saw the show, and I, oh my God, this guy's amazing. Um, because his his work activated the spaces of the rooms. Sometimes even before you enter, this glow kind of leaking out one room next, and the light changed constantly. Um, not only as but as your eye got saturated one color tone, the color magically would change because of how our eyes were. Uh, so I talked to him about the show, but I also talked about the vision for for the museum, and he said with which is in this era the the museum be the town square where people of us come together from all walks of life from all different economic strata and really have a common meeting public square a place where they social and interact with the culture of their time and from other times but but really that it served this this very um social function um not just repository for great artwork and he took the museum very much in the direction you know they were always having um musical pieces and things that activated the space museum as well as what was inside in galleries um i love that openness of of the, the different historical periods that the museum's different buildings kind of represented so, one, yeah, it was kind of a hot one hand, but then the other hand, it was kind of a great reflection of what is Los Angeles, which is awesome. Yes, it is. Yes. I kind of liked how well it reflected the city. So uh, I love Michael. I love his, his passion, his dedication, a genius in so many ways. But I have to say, I talk about his, this, this particular 
new iteration of the museum, but but I'm concerned. Concerns I have, we've lost from what I've read, you know, um, a significant amount of, of space, um, and uh, will it have the same kind of open courtyard ground opportunities. Those things I don't know, so I'm um, a bit agnostic, but concerned. Well, it's going to be exciting to see how this whole thing develops. So somebody has just um, asked me, um, are, there, are there trends in art, and do you see any new trend e uh, developing or evolving in the Los Angeles art scene? Um, I do. We, I, um, once, once we became globally aware through not just mm -hmm. the internet, travel, and uh, you no longer have these sort of pockets of, of schools of artwork and ideas kind of um, gestating in, in isolated. Now you have an artist from China or Russia or um, South America influenced by something going on in New York. And so cross-pollination, a lot of communication of ideas and, and thinking about it. so. I guess what I've seen over the last few years is there is uh, a vocabulary available to artists now that is great. So, you know, as always, you know, it, it's great to have a large vocabulary. Um, you can express yourself more specifically, but it also means you have to make more, which, you know, if you have words to describe a particular situation, you now have more to choose from, and so you have to choose more wisely and really be focused on what it is you want to say. And that hasn't changed. So I think artists, I, I talk to young artists, they show me their work. The first thing I look for is, have they really found their voice as an artist? You know, have they dug deep inside to find out what it is that they uniquely say and want to say, and then to the tools to express it. And a lot of times they have a lot to say, but they don't have yeah. that be incredibly gifted, but they haven't learned to play. So I, I talk in the artists and I say, you need to learn to play your because I think you've got a lot to say, but you need to really work on learning to play that and you right. and vocabulary. So uh, what trends do I see? I think that um, there is, there is more interest than ever in, in areas of, of art, uh, people who've been overlooked and ignored. So I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, a lot of light and sunshine um, on their work uh, like never before. The same things with artists of color and uh, different entities are uh, really in a lot of attention right now because they overlooked and, and not right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I. Uh, Talk with uh, Ed Moses, Ed Rache, Harry Bell, and Bill Dixon at the Broad stage about four years. Um, uh, and, I, and I wanted to capture their stories um, while they still were all with us. Um, and they'd known each other for a long time. They all showed at the Ferris, sort of a legendary seminal. And at that time, the art world in Los Angeles and elsewhere was very. And there were, you know, very, very, very few collectors who supported that work. So all the artists kind of knew each other, uh, and and it was very self um, uh, find group figure out how to support themselves and do their artwork. So they told their stories, and one of the first questions I got asked, after what I thought was this amazing evening, was, well, "Why didn't you have any women artists on?" And I said, "Well, there were women artists." gallery um, but there weren't a lot of them and this was a moment in time that I wanted to capture for their stories but you know it's a good point and I think you know then um, there is there's been a lot of concern why haven't we stories I mean that's one of the points of of my exhibition mark uh, Greenfield right now you know why haven't we heard the stories of these these amazing figures in history? And so in the same way with artists, I think a lot of artists are getting attention right now, just so who wouldn't have uh, 
in past year. Right. So, Bill, what is the best way to somebody for somebody to learn a little bit about more about the artists that you represent in the gallery? Is it through your website? That's yeah. I mean, I don't have a range of images on the website, but it's a good introduction just to get an overview of sort of the artists we work with and show. I was was really blessed to get Ed Moses for the end of his life, last five years, and uh-huh. so I did a lot of work with Ed, interesting information from interviews we did, discussions we had, and so on. Similarly, the first part of COVID, when everyone sort of locked down, I did a show called All Together Now, one piece by every artist I worked. And then during the course of the show, uh, I did a, a Zoom interview, which we recorded, which is on our website, of each of the artists, talking about their work, talking about their studio, and you got to win their practice through that. And it made it a very special time. You know, we didn't know what the other side of it was going to look like and if we're all going to survive it. You know, it was a time filled with a lot of but it did open up some silver linings of opportunity. One of those was to slow down and really bring people into the artists who I love so much into their studios and get to know them better. So that's a really great way is to go on my website and start, you know, start going through some of those interviews. Is, you know, they're all listed on there. And right. other work, there's nothing like seeing work in person. <laughs> no, you need to see it in person. You need to experience art. Um, you know, it's great that you took us through today and showed us pieces, but you miss a lot just in the videos. Uh, being in front of a, a work of art is very different, the texture, the whole experience. So I encourage everybody um, to uh, just explore art. And when you get a chance, visit Williams Gallery. It's really stunning. And, you know, Bill, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and um, educating us more about the world of art and your vision. So thank you so much. I'll give your your uh, viewers um, a good excuse to come to the gallery tomorrow. We're doing a at for the okay. game for Halo, and Mark is a tour of the show, talk about some of the pieces and his process and his practice. Uh, he's a very fun, very interesting guy. I've known him for 30 years, and and you will be well reported by and it's tomorrow at 3 o'clock uh, or begins at 3.30 we'll have some wine and refreshments and sort of things, so it should be a fun can't wonderful have, I'm at my station July 9th, we're also going to have a, a, a campus wide open house with all the galleries open and special things uh, and that'll be all day at July 9th, so one of those two times great time to Wonderful. Somebody just asked where the gallery is. They must have missed the earlier part. It's at the Bergamont Station in Santa Monica. We encourage everybody to go visit. So thank you so much, Bill. It was really enjoyable. Likewise. Have a great day. All right. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our visit with William. Um, We are now doing Designers at Home shows monthly. And we'll be announcing our next guest shortly, and we hope you'll join us. Remember, if you enjoy these shows, to share them with people, share them with your friends. They're available on YouTube. They're available on podcast, Instagram, all all under Mark Weaver and Associates. Um, And we encourage you to follow us. We have some very, very exciting guests coming up um, this year. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next month. Thank you so much.